Thank you, worship team. Thank you so much for leading us. Uh, I heard an illustration this week that I thought was pretty good. Is uh, one of the things that happens to us every day uh, is somebody is trying to get us to put on their set of binoculars. And if you've ever looked through the binoculars, which I do on occasion, I have these binoculars that hang in the back of my house. Uh, and I have some bird feeders that I just decided to actually fill with bird feed at the end. So the birds that went through the worst of the winter already died. So I have the ones that are left. Uh, but uh, I just put some uh, bird feeders up and I love to get out those uh, uh, binoculars and look at them. And of course, what binoculars do is they remove everything else that's in the near view and everything that's on the side. And they focus you in <clears throat> right on whatever it is that you're trying to look at. And we live in a world, right, where Jesus told us, he told us, and you can read about it in Matthew 24, 25, if you want to go there, that we live in a world where there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Um, and so we're not surprised, but one of the things that often happens in the world in which we live is they want us to put their binoculars on and focus in on the things that they think are the crucial things that are happening, uh, the geopolitical scene. Uh, and of course, as followers of Jesus, uh, we want to not let them put uh, their binoculars on. We want to put on the specs that the Word of God gives us about what's important and, and what we should be doing. Uh, and here in particular, as Steve, uh, Pastor Steve was praying, uh, we're aware that God is at work, that number one, that uh, even if uh, Putin is uh, trying to conquer the world, that ultimately he'll fail. Uh, and that uh, he's not in control of events, that God ultimately is sovereign. And two, that uh, it's his mission that's happening around the world. Uh, and we want to pray especially for the people of God in those places who are going through just utter tragedy uh, and unimaginable things. I was sitting there talking with Ronnie yesterday about what on earth would it be like to have uh, soldiers overrunning your town and buildings exploding and people dying around you. Uh, it just would be unimaginable. Uh, and I'm praying for the people of God to hold on to the security they have in Christ so that they can have an unearthly calm and a real focus uh, to be about what they need to. Praying for moms and dads uh, to not be overrun with fears. They worry about their kids uh, for safety and protection. Uh, but ultimately, every believer uh, is fully secure and nothing can really threaten them because all the things that really threaten them are already taken care of. And so I'm asking for God to give them strength and courage to live boldly in these places. Um, I'm asking for his mission to go forward. Sometimes in the face of tragedy, people are very open uh, to the gospel in these moments. And I'm praying for them to live boldly for Christ in these days. And I'm praying for us as his people uh, that we will uh, do what God wants us to do uh, where we are. Uh, and uh, if we can help in any way that we'll do that. One of the things also about putting on binoculars is if uh, the news and, and the social media and different things always want you to keep you looking at the distance and take uh, your, your eyes off of your own heart and eyes off of your own family and eyes off of your own responsibility. And so we want to take the specks of God's word today and put them on uh, and let him probe. And he's going to get at the core of all fighting uh, between all people, either on the personal level or on the national level, uh, and it has to do with pride. And so we're going to talk about pride today from, from James chapter 4, and I want to invite you to turn to James chapter 4 with me, and we're going to work through this whole chapter. Uh, this time I was sharing with the team just before uh, that I, I worked really hard this week ruthlessly to cut out all kinds of things because I realized in other times I had preached at least three sermons out of this one chapter. Uh, so I promise you it won't be three sermons, uh, and we will, we will finish uh, sometime before like 6 o'clock today, uh, just to encourage you right as we go through. I uh, found the, the, the passage just to be incredibly convicting this week. Uh, in the history of the church uh, and its reflection uh, on human sin and human behavior, uh, many of you are familiar with what's known as the seven deadly sins. Uh, that's a kind of a collection of wisdom that the church really uh, has put together that's called from the scriptures themselves. And in the seven deadly sins, it's argued that the chief of sins, matter of fact, the fountain of all the other sins is pride. And if you want to look at that scripturally, you can look at it from the Garden of Eden and that the fundamental issue there in the Garden of Eden is, do I trust myself or do I trust God? Do I trust myself or do I trust God? And of course, Adam and Eve decided to trust themselves. 
They thought they knew better. They doubted God's goodness, which is a key idea in the book of James, and they begin to doubt whether he had their best in mind, and they begin to doubt whether or not they should, they should bow the knee to his wisdom and let him tell them who, he, who they are and how they should live and what they should do, and instead they decided to go their own direction, and of course things went really, really badly. And so one of the core struggles in human existence is we want glory, we want glory. And the scriptures call that vain glory, empty glory. Uh, we want to be made much of. We want our ideas in a given group of people to be the ones that everybody thinks are the best ideas. We want our preferences, even for a church community, we want those to be respected. We want our kind of music. We want it to look aesthetically the way we want it to. Uh, we want it to be organized around what we think is important. And all those types of things, at the end of the day, we want to be made much of. We don't speak straightforwardly that way because it just seems too ugly, right, to say that straight out. Uh, but it's reflected in the fact that when things don't go our way, we pout and we're aggravated, uh, we're upset. Uh, we judge one another because you didn't do it the way I thought you should have done it. Uh, you don't have enough emphasis on that. You, you overemphasize this, all those kind of things like that. But at the end of the day, often we judge a quality of a day by how um, much I was made of, right? How many people like me? How many people followed me? How significant am I? Am I? As a matter of fact, we live in a world where uh, one of the goals of many of the influencers is to be a person who's at the center of everybody else's life. Your life becomes so interesting that you have millions of people that follow every little thing that you do. And they want to hear what you have to say. They want to see where you go. They want to see what you wear. They want to hear from you about everything. And matter of fact, the goal of that world is to be an influencer so that you're the center of other people's lives, that lots of glory comes to you, right? And then you monetize that glory so that you get the benefits of it. Uh, and as your, uh, I was looking at the stats the other day uh, because I think one influencer was posting uh, how much uh, her, her followers had monetized in and how much money she was making from a particular little reel that she sent out. And it was a nice little payday, right? For her to put out something innocuous and silly or something that uh, really was uh, paying attention to an average event in somebody's day and all of a sudden she's got a million people who want to watch her, right, make her supper, right, or whatever. Right, those kinds of things. And so we live in a world where being at the center of other people's worlds is really an aspiration that we want right, in terms of that. So let's come to a passage where James is going to deal with the kind of conflict that comes from a group of people that are full of themselves. Right? Uh, pride eviscerate marriages. Right? You're not uh, in a marriage, a Christian marriage, my goal should be to love my wife to Christ as Christ. But in many marriages, my goal is to shape my wife into someone that I more enjoy. Same way with my husband. My husband, I want to shape him into someone that I enjoy more. I want him to have my preferences. I want him to want what I want. Right, as I've joked with you before, we have this phrase, if that person was more like me, they would be so much more enjoyable. Right? We work really hard, right? We want them to want what we want, like what we want, to respond the way we do. Um, I remember, especially as Ron and I first uh, were married, uh, you know my wife, my wife, when things are going well, you know they're going well because she's saying, this is amazing, this is great, right? She's uh, the little boy off of uh, uh, The Incredibles. I love my family, right? This is, this is Rana, right? And when things are not going well, she's equally going to tell you on the other side, that's not going well, or I don't like that. Uh, it's like uh, when it comes to coffee with my wife, there are no, uh, I love coffee, she hates coffee, right? So there's no, like, I don't, so slightly don't like it. I've even tried to kind of sneak it in to her life, uh, but she has this detector. I got her on mocha at one time, and I'm not kidding, the very first drink was, is there coffee in that? And I said, yeah, there is. Oh, I hate that, right? Kind of thing like that, right? No, no, I just don't prefer the flavor of it. Or if you put these kinds of things in it, I would like it. No, it's, it's, it's one way or the other. And uh, I remember her, at the very beginning of our marriage, she would make something and she would get so upset because I wouldn't respond to it the way that she would have responded to it. So I would, I would eat it, whatever it was that she made, and, and she would say, well, what do you think? And I'd say, it was good. Is that all? Is that, is, that, is that all it is? Like just good? 
right? Is it great? Would you eat it again, right? She would narrate a whole bunch of, you know, p possible responses that I should have given rather than, right? No, it's, it's good. No, no, come on. Now, scale one to ten, right? So we, we used to joke about the fact that I used to have to stand up and say, you know, ten or yell it out and say, it's the greatest thing ever, right? But again, the, the issue is, is that it was her wanting me to respond in a way that she understood what that meant, and she felt that my response was not adequate given the labor and the quality of the food that I was eating, right? And probably that was true in terms of that. So when we come to the issue of pride, it affects us in every way. It affects roommates. It affects husbands and wives. It affects colleagues at work. It affects church members who are working in the same area. And pride is one of those uh, sins that gets you at your strength. Usually your struggle with pride is in with another person who's doing the very same thing that you're doing. So moms struggle with being prideful with respect to other moms and dads with other dads and, and engineers with other engineers, right? So you don't com compete with other people that you don't have an expertise, but you compete with the people in your area. Uh, and pride wants to make you the top person. Matt, this is why you can have a group of women who are all struggling to raise their kids as are all of the dads, and they have fears. They don't want to be a cruddy mom. They don't want their kids to turn out poorly. They want them to do well, but their pride will keep them from admitting to the other mothers that they're afraid about some habit or something that's going on in their child's life because they don't want to appear like they don't know what they're doing. They want to be the source of other people coming to help them fix their kids in terms of that. So pride will separate us from one another. It'll turn us on one another in terms of that behavior. Well, let's come to the book of James, and I'm going to read here from the book of James, and let's just begin, and I'm going to read the first five verses, and then we'll come back and talk our way through it. If you, if you have a bulletin, you should have an outline to work through, and, and again, I want to encourage you to pick up a pen or a pencil and use that outline. Uh, you will not write down everything I say. That would be impossible. But there will be something I'm confident because of God's word that God will want you to hear today. As a matter of fact, want you to hear and walk away with and think about, right? And, and again, you know, this is one of those things, if you don't think you're proud, well, then we know you are uh, in terms of that, uh, if you don't think you're proud. Uh, because there's something here for every one of us today, and I hope you're, you're willing to hear what God wants to say. So here's chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, uh, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Now, let me walk through a, a couple things here just to remind you. We're in the book of James, and, and there's a lot of uh, echoes of what's going on in, in the world uh, uh, in many, many different places because we're uh, talking about counsel that a pastor is giving to a group of refugees, people who are fleeing for their lives. And they're being persecuted not by uh, unknown individuals from some foreign country. They're being persecuted by fellow Jews uh, who have rejected the Messiah that they have believed in and don't recognize him as the coming promised Davidic king. And they've rejected him. And so some of the first Christians to die were killed by their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters, the people they go into synagogue with, the people that were their parents and their relatives. And they're going through a, just a tremendous social dislocation, not only in the fact that they're literally being kicked out of the places where they live, and so they're fleeing into Jerusalem and the areas around it in Judea and even spreading out a little bit further. You can read about this in, in, in Acts chapter 8. But they're, they're fleeing for their lives and people that will later uh, come to worship Jesus as Lord. The Apostle Paul, who now is just known as Saul, he's one of the ringleaders that's looking to arrest people, bring them up before the religious authorities, and is even condoning uh, their killing. 
as he did with Stephen's. And so this is a really a time of great distress, a time of real difficulty. And just as we've said before, these are moms and dads with, with children, right? These are older people who are not suited to flee. These are uh, parents who are worried about, they have dreams for their kids, they have dreams for their own lives, they're under tremendous stress, marriages are under stress, families are under stress, older people are facing situations that really are beyond their physical ability to flee from. All those kinds of things are happening and they find themselves moving to surrounding areas and they're vulnerable people that are ripe for exploitation. And as we're going to read when we get into chapter five, that's exactly what's happening to them. People are seeing them as a, a ripe group of people to take advantage of. And so somebody's hiring them to do some work and they need to work. They need to provide for their families. They need to get a roof over the head. And matter of fact, they're trying to suck up to powerful people because they need protection. Uh, in this environment where people are literally going after them. And so they're using their little assemblies, they're gathering together and they're trying to elevate people who curse the name of Jesus so that they can get some protection from them and get some jobs. And so they go to work for these people and then after a day's work, they decide, well, I don't need to pay these guys because there's another thousand of them to fill in when they go. And so at the end of the day, they kick, kick them free uh, and don't pay them for the work that they've had. And so they're exploited, they're in trouble, they're under distress. And James steps in to this environment and he says, you need to trust God in this moment and turn to him. And the fundamental thing that James is after, you need to hold fast to him, as we've been talking about, because God is good and every good resource comes down from him. The only way you're going to get through this difficulty without, without complicating it by going down the path of death and without missing out on the opportunities of what God wants to do is if you hold on to him and you turn to him and you call out to him and listen to him for wisdom. And so in the middle of that, what we find in chapter four is one of the things that happen if you've ever been in a crisis with any group of people, right? In a group of people, you have really one of two responses that you find. They either turn to each other or they turn on each other, right? Now, I know everyone who's married has known the turn on each other moment, right? When a kid's sick, when something goes wrong, right? The turn on moment is, how could you do that, right? How could you forget our child at church, right? You left them there, right? Don't you know you have children, right? How could you do that? How could you back into the garage door? How could you do that? I mean, it's, it's like filling your rearview mirror, right? Didn't you check before you pulled out, right? And those are all minimal things, right? I remember those moments when Ron and I were, when our girls were little and we had asthma going on and we're, we had these interminable discussions about whether we should go to the hospital or not. And as they're, <coughs> oh, right here next to you, and they're coughing, coughing, coughing. And one of our daughters in particular just had this ongoing cough that just kept going and going and going. And it would just be there just like, you know, somebody whacking you upside the head. And my anxiety was rising. And we're having this discussion. It's more like, should we go? I don't know. What do you think? Should we go? I don't know. And it was really, you know, kind and loving, right, as we were trying to do that. And the stress, the stress, right, was pulling out stuff out of us, fear, anxiety, all those kind of things like that. And a lot of times, right, if you're at work, men, you've known this, you go to work and you're having trouble with your boss, he's beating down on you and you can't say it back to him or to her. And so you go home and take it out on your family. You go home and take it out on somebody else. And so the person who should get the best you gets the crappiest you, right? Because you're, you're thinking, and so you get conflicts, right? And you're battling. And then sometimes because we're sophisticated, right, as adults, and we don't want the social cost that comes from punching somebody that we disagree with, that we do other things. We slander them. We talk behind their back. We try to manipulate events. We try to uh, tell other people and, and work around them and do power plays and so forth and so on because we're playing this little game about who's on top. And so we've got all kinds of things, but we, it's too costly to go up and punch you in the nose, even though that's what I'd like to do right, in terms of that. And so what you have here is you've got the stress boiling over and James is going to say, I know you don't believe that God is good. I know you're not turning to him because if you were, you would not be behaving toward each other this way. And James, as always, this symptom is their conflict with one another. He's going to say the cause is their spiritual adultery, right? So he's going to go down to the source 
of their unwillingness to trust God and they're turning to trust themselves instead of turning to God in an utter dependence, crying out for him for wisdom, leaning into the perfect law that gives freedom and paying attention until they hear his word and wisdom. And instead of doing that, they're turning on each other because they've got to figure out how to get out of the circumstances they're in because obviously God either isn't there or he's not good or he's inept, but whatever, I'm not going to turn to him. So I gotta figure out my own resources. And so now you have a bunch of competing gods who are competing against each other to try to figure out how to survive in a very dark situation, right? So this is an ugly setting. People are afraid. And what I wanna say about this too, we've noticed this in James so much. James, I don't know if James would be suited for our moment because um, James doesn't spend a whole lot of time helping them feel good about themselves. He just doesn't spend a lot of time Say, hey, I love you guys. He says he pleads with them, brothers and sisters. He doesn't spend a lot of time worrying about the, that they're too fragile for him to tell them the truth. So he's going to jump in and tell them the truth because it's a time of, uh, of dire crisis. And so he doesn't spend a whole lot of time building a long, long, long platform right, to do these kinds of things, he just comes in and he says, I, I want to I ask you, where does all of these conflicts come from? Where are they coming from? What's going on that's causing you to war and battle among yourselves, right? And he's going to go straight after it. It comes, well, you don't even go to God and ask him for any help, so obviously he's irrelevant. And then if you do go to ask him, you go to tell him what he should do. So James is going to go right after them. And in the moment in which you and I live, right, that kind of straightforward conversation is assumed to be automatically unloving, uncaring. Now, I'm not saying that in every event, the James approach is the right of approach to go after, right? But I'm saying in our contemporary moment, speaking the truth directly to someone and saying, you know what he's going to say? This is what's so offensive in our moment. It's your fault. Okay, you just hear that one again. Right? If you ever somebody walk in and talk about, you know, there's a fight between you and your wife. It's your fault. But you don't understand my wife. If you had my wife, you'd understand why. No, no, it's your fault. You don't have to respond. She doesn't make you angry. You decide to be angry. It's your fault. Okay? That kind of language is like, oh, but you don't understand. You don't know how hard it is. You don't know about my past. This brings up every bad thing about my past. Yes, it's your fault. Right? But we live in a moment of excusing our behavior on everything external to us. It's a system that we're a part of. It's a group of people around me, right? Even, even among Christians, when we find young people who are heading off in the wrong direction, we blame their peer group as if their peer group somehow kidnapped them and made them a part of it. No peer group kidnaps them. You choose your peer group. All those things happen, and James wants to come in and say the resources are ours to pull on in God and that the circumstances can't be blamed for your behavior. And one of the things that's so shocking about this behavior, you're going to say, I, I think that James said, James, can you not give them a little slack? Can you not give them a little slack, James? Come on, right? Like, like uh, when I think of slack, I think of my mom as a grandmother, right? Grandmother slack, right? So my mom will distract, will reorient will do all kinds of things, but she will not call out what I see happening, right? Especially when the girls were little, she wouldn't call it out. And, and they, the girls would be manipulative. They would be all kinds of different things, those sweet little pure things, right? Doing all the things that they were doing. Uh, and, and my mom would just, oh, I love them. They're just great. And she would redirect them. She would do the things like that, uh, that would do that, even when they were working around what mom and dad said they shouldn't do, right? She was trying, and she would often come to me and say, oh, Greg, now don't be so hard on them. Don't be so hard on them, Greg. They're just, you know, and she was the advocate for all of the soft sweetness, right, that was going on uh, when dad was saying, no, 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 she's manipulating you, mom, and I don't want her to do that. I know, but she's sweet. I love her, and it's not, not a problem. I've got plenty of gum, even though she's asked for it 30 times, right? Whatever it is, right? 
Uh, so I, and I love my mom for that. She doesn't want to be the parent. She wants to be the grandparent, right? That's exactly, and I'm glad that she can do that. But, but the thing is, is that often we as, as followers, uh, fellow followers of Christ is that we listen to uh, our sister who's struggling in her marriage and we never call her to her own responsibilities. We listen to a husband who's struggling in his marriage and we don't call him to his own responsibilities. We listen to a brother or sister who whines about their job and we don't challenge them about what kind of person they are at the job. Because I can't control other things other than myself. And so James is just going to say, I grant all these things are going on, but I want to talk to you about you and about what this is saying about your heart because you're not turning to God, right? So if you look here in verse one, he says the inner cause of their conflict, and you'll see this in your notes, is a corrupted heart, a corrupted heart. And we've talked about this here. You know, one thing's about pressure, pressure breaks the facades okay most of us we can control ourselves when life is normal but you get a week where you know as a college student you got four exams uh and you've got a paper due uh and you've got some other commitment that's going on and all of a sudden the pressure's cranked up and all of a sudden you're a surly not very kind person right and it's not all of a sudden that you were possessed by some surly demon, right? That's just in you waiting to come out and the pressure has brought it to the fore. And how you deal with it is something else. Same way when job is going great and you're working well at your job and everybody's saying great job, it's a little bit different when you've got pressure to perform or you may, the, the factory may close or things may shift and you've got to make some decisions. Then, right, it breaks down all the facades of kindness that we build up when things are just the sun shining and things going well. Same thing happens in marriage, right? And so the issue here is James is going to say it's coming from your response demonstrates that your heart is governed by a wisdom that's from below. Do you remember that from the previous chapter? Look back in verse, uh, uh, chapter 3. Look at uh, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast without, about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, quote unquote, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, right? And so what they're demonstrating, we know as we read the whole of scripture, if the spirit of God is at work and dominating the hearts of the people, as they gather together, there is unity. There is oneness. There is a sharing of honor. There is a mutual appreciation. There is an acceptance of one another, a bearing of one another's burdens. So when you know that you see hostility and battles, that's not the work of the Spirit. That's demonic. And so what James is talking about here is that it's, real, it's helping them see that the darkness in their souls, right, the part of us that we're waiting for God to transform is coming out in this time of pressure. And so instead of them turning to God, they're just manifesting the darkness in their souls and they're giving rain to it. And the evil one is being followed. This is why he's going to say a little bit later, you need to resist him and you need to follow Jesus, right, as we go there. So the inner corrupted hearts. Then the dynamics of the conflict. Look at verses two and three. What happens then, right? So the conflict is here, but what are the things that are underlying it? It says in verse three, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill, right? Now we don't, I think James is using this metaphorically. I don't think there are dead Christians laying around, right, in this church. Um, but he speaks about this in the same way uh, that uh, in essence, I'm treating someone as if I wish they were dead, or they don't matter to me, okay? Now, I, mean, I, I know, I, I joke with my students at Cedarville, I, I've very seldom ever had at Cedarville on the campus two students throw down in some piece of grass out on Cedarville campus, right? Like, fight, 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 and everybody runs out there. Now, that's, I, haven't, I haven't seen that in all the years I've been there. It's probably happened somewhere, but I haven't seen it, right? But that doesn't mean that there aren't kids that just hate one another because I've had conversations with them. I've had conversations with someone that can barely stand to be in the room with the person that they're rooming with, with somebody that they feel like has just ripped their heart out, a guy or a girl, and they're angry, and it's hard for them to even look at them, right? With somebody who's sitting in my office who's been hurt deeply by a parent, and, and they, they hate them, 
and they realize that they do, and they want to deal with that cancer that's killing them, right? So here the issue here is you can even have it in a church where you can find people who really, really don't like one another, but they've, just, they've learned how to walk around the church, how to be in the church without ever having to actually have a real conversation with the other person, right? You, you've seen that. I mean, I know we've all done it, where you see somebody that you see coming, and you find out, well, I think this hallway is a better hallway than the one I'm in. So I think I'll turn left here and go around here. Or, oh, I think I have to go to the bathroom right now. Oh, maybe I should get a cup of coffee. Right? Whatever, whatever the case may be, we know in our own souls that we've got something there and we're trying to avoid that in that conflict. I've had that happen to me in a store, seeing somebody down the aisle and say, well, I don't think I need coffee yet. I'll go around and get it down the other aisle. All that kind of thing that he's talking about here. So you, you fight and you battle, you crave things and you don't have them. And then what has? You don't ask God. And I'm going to say pride shows up in two forms here. If you want to, you see it here. Pride will show up in, your, uh, in adversity for you when you don't go to God to ask for help. So he's irrelevant. So it's a pride of irrelevance. Okay? So you're going through a stressful time and, and you haven't prayed. You haven't even talked to God about it. You're struggling with another person and you haven't even paused to think about it. Right? With your husband, your wife, your, your employer, right? your neighbor, uh, a brother, a sister in your home, right? There's never any conflict between brothers and sisters in homes, right? All those kind of things. And you've never prayed about it. You've never come to the Lord and, and asked him for resources and wisdom, right, on how to do it. You haven't turned to his word to think about how should I be treating this person? So you don't go to him. So God's irrelevant. And that shows that really you don't believe that God is good and that the resources that you need come from him. So he's irrelevant to this picture. I got to figure it out on my own. Or what's even a little bit more heinous, the other one is when you go to God, this is where, you know, God's kind of inept, right? Or he needs some help. And so you go to God and you ask with evil motives what James is talking about. Really, you come to him to tell him what he should do to be a good God. And this is going to show up later on with plans. God, I have a plan. God, I know what role I want to play in this organization, or I know how I want to be regarded, or I know what is best, and God, I'm coming to you to get so-and-so to get on my team, or to make sure that I triumph over so-and-so, right? But the goal is here is that God is the one who you're not coming to him and submitting to him. You're not coming to listen to him for wisdom. You're not trusting his way of dealing with your brother or sister. You're going to get God on your side to try to manipulate him to do what you want, right? And this is one of the things that happens in, in trials. Trials are one of the things that God does to blow up our sense that we're in control of our lives. We're not in control of when we're, going, when we're born or when we're going to die. We're not in control of the attitudes and hearts of the people around us. We're not in control of our own abilities to sustain our employment. We're not in control of those things. We don't have any control over those issues, and we think we do, and we think we're wise enough to tell God about how he should run his planet and run my life. And trials come in, and all of a sudden, something happens. You get a diagnosis. You thought you were going to get married, and then you were going to have children, and then you find out you're infertile. Or you get married and then all of a sudden you have a child that has real challenges. That was not your vision of parenthood. Well, then you get married and something happens to your spouse, your wife, your husband. Maybe they have mental struggles. Maybe they have a deep reversal. Maybe in the process something that's deep and dark from them that they've hidden now comes to the fore. You didn't sign up for that. That wasn't a part of the contract. Right? You, go, you work at a job, and you're doing your job, and you're being faithful, and you're treating people well, and you get unjustly slandered and fired. You get mistreated. You get overlooked. All those things happen, and all of a sudden, there you are in that moment. Right? You don't have control over those things in your life. And so here, instead of turning to God, they go to God, right? and this is one of those moments, and I've had those moments where I'm aggravated with God. God, how could you let this happen in my life? Like, God, I had the plan, and if you were a good God, you would be working my plan right now. 
So it's obvious that you're not a good God or else you weren't paying attention, right? Uh, because I know what should be happening in my life right now and I should not be sitting in this hospital uh, parking lot right now worried to death about my daughter. I should not be here. God, I shouldn't have to deal with this. I shouldn't be treated this way by these people. I shouldn't have these things. And we get in that kind of moment, and God is making us realize that I don't, I'm not in control of life, that I don't have the, the knowledge of how to navigate it, that I need to submit myself to him. But in that moment, our pride shows up in the fact that I don't even talk to God because he's no help. Or when I do, I plead with him to do what I want him to do because I know best, and as soon as I can get him on my program, we'll be fine. So that's what happens here. So James wants to dig in and say that the real problem then in verses four and five, if you look here with me, is spiritual adultery. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Now this is such a, it seems like James just kind of turns the corner and you're going, James, what does this have to do with friendship with the world? How am I an enemy of God? How am I an adulterer all the time, right? Now, James draws on a long uh, usage of this term, right? An adulterer is someone who gives their affections to someone other than to whom they belong, right? So as a husband, I'm an adulterer if I give the affections that belong to my wife to anyone else. The scriptural term is I defraud her of what belongs to her and I give to someone else what does not belong to them and I'm an adulterer, right? This is the same way where it will use as a synonym, especially the prophets will talk about spiritual adultery and spiritual idolatry, right? Adultery means that you're giving your affections to someone that they don't belong. Idolatry is speaking about the object of those affections that you're giving it to. So instead of giving God the rightful affection that he deserves, you're giving it to some other claim it to be God, right? And for Paul, and for the New Testament in particular, always idols are, and, and idol worship are always elaborate forms of self-worship, right? Now, this is what I get it. So the, the competition is always between you, I, and God. Because there are no other gods, there are no other beings to be worshiped that are equal to God, there's other spiritual beings, but there is no other God. And so the gods that humans create, I don't care what religion you want to talk about, are all creations of the humans that participate in those religions. They've created that God. They dictate what that God requires of them. They dictate the terms on which you get right with that God and what the God does. And so all human beings, in other than worshiping the sovereign God, are the wizards behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz. Because the gods that I made, that I worship, are indirectly a worship of myself. Because I've made myself the God maker and the one who determines what God is and what he does. And so the, con- the conflict here, it's a matter of pride, right? This is at the core of the, of the fall with, with Adam and Eve, right? What's the decision? Do I let God tell me who I am? Do I let God tell me what's right and wrong? Or do I tell myself who I am and tell what myself what's right and wrong? Adam goes, I choose me. Now that worship of myself could take all kinds of religious forms, but ultimately at the bottom, I know better than God, and so I'm going to go, of course, the way I think is best. So pride is at the core. And so they're adulterers because instead of giving God their complete trust and faith, instead of coming to him and bowing before him, instead of asking God, God, you're a good God, would you please give us wisdom and strength and resources to respond to this in a way that would honor you and and promote your growth in me? Instead, they say, well, I guess I got to figure this out on my own. Or I got to manipulate God in some way to get him on my side. Now, in the ancient world in which you're part of, that was very, very common right? The human actor was right at the center, and you tried to appease the gods and manipulate the gods and get them to do what you wanted, and so they're behaving. This is why James says, you're becoming a part of the world friend group, because you're operating just like pagans do with relationship to God. They're the center of their world. They're trying to manipulate God, coerce God, placate God, and you're not, you're not on his team anymore. You're his enemy, and you're operating as if you belong to a different team. 
And don't you know that that's being an enemy of God? Not that you're just disobeying God. This is what's so stri- uh, striking about it. You're, you're directly in opposition to God. You're putting yourself over against God and his will. And so James comes after them and said that the core problem is, is you are elevating yourself and demoting God. You're either kicking him to the curb altogether or you're disrespecting him by thinking that he needs your help to tell you what to do. Okay? So the issue here is James goes after them. Now, come down. What does he say is the remedy? Okay, I want to say something about verse uh, 5 here before we get a little bit further. He says, Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Now, this is one of those places where uh, this is one of the most debated verses in this whole passage. Is God the one who's longing for our faithfulness? Or is James really speaking about the fact that we have dark desires that long to elevate ourselves? Okay? And if you look at different translations, those are the two options. So is it a good spirit of longing right, for God and his rule in my life? Or is it my spirit that loves to elevate myself? Right? Now, I tend to think, over against what's here, that I think uh, James is speaking about, about the scriptural teaching that makes us aware that the real struggle that you have is right in your heart. And he's dealing with that you're, haven't you learned from scripture that your heart is evil and desperately wicked and that it's a threat to your well-being? And so haven't you paid attention to that? And let me give you some scripture that's dealing with that, right? The naivete. I, I, just, I just say this here, right? I say this sometimes at Cedarville, and I say it here. Your real threat today is not your wife or your husband, okay? Your real threat's not your professor, even though I am demon incarnate in some places, right? Your real threat is not your boss. Your real threat is not that person in the past who maybe hurt you. Real threat isn't Putin. Real threat isn't pick your one there, right? The real threat is right in here. Everything that can destroy you and destroy the people in your life, apart from the grace of God to enable you to submit yourself to the passions and priorities of Jesus, resides right here. And if you don't draw near to God, if you don't rely on the habits that he's given you to restrain and transform your soul, there's things right in here that are going to just flare out and murder people and abuse people, and elevate yourself, and turn things that God has given you for your blessing into things that enslave you, like food. All that is right in here. It's right here, right? The threat is not external to you. The threat is right here. The resources are found only in Christ to restrain this. Only. Only in Christ to restrain this. There's no ascetic practices where you deprive yourself. There's no, there's no place to go where you can get in the right environment and make sure you have all the right people around you, right? This has to be a transformation that comes from the inside out because it's right here. The darkness that can destroy your marriage, can destroy your friendships, can destroy your relationships with people, it's right here. And this is what you need to pay attention to on a day-by-day basis. The world wants you to keep the binoculars on and keep looking away from your heart and looking at the people around you. It's them. It's her. It's him. It's that group of people. It's the way this society is organized. I want to keep it here. And again, I'm not arguing that, that what's happening out here is all good. I'm not trying to say that. But what they want to say to you is that you don't have, it's, you're, you're left with them getting their act together and you don't have any responsibility for your responses and the way you're navigating the world in which you're in. What James wants to come back and say is that no, here you need to hold on to God wholeheartedly. You need to turn to him every time. You need to lean in on him completely. You need to listen to him without qualification. You need to follow him as if it's the only way to survive. You need to lean in, listen, because he's the only one that can tell you how to live in freedom. He's the only one that can do that, right? And so when James is saying here, he's making them aware of the long history of of teaching in Scripture 
right? Let me give you one. We all know this one, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What about Jesus in Matthew 15? Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemy. And then, of course, James in James 1.14. But every man, every person is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Okay? So, pride wants to, one of the functions of pride, right, is that it can't be me. Right? One of, the, uh, one of the pairs of binoculars that the pride wants to put on your face every day is it can't be me, it's got to be them. Because I, I deserve to be served, to worshipped, to followed, to get paid attention to, right? I deserve that, right? That's the way the world wants us to think, okay? Now, what's the, what's the, the thing? Thankfully, God says he gives more grace, Right? God gives power to us to overcome the darkness in our souls. But, he, but, but it says in um, verse 6, but he gives more grace. This is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. And so the cure is grace, right? And the question is, well, how do you, how do you draw on God's grace? How do you draw on? Well, James has made that clear. You draw on God's grace by, by going to the word of God, leaning into it to listen and obey it. Right? It says that back in chapter 1, right? You come to listen to obey. And so you're listening to the word of God because that's God's will. That's his goodness being declared for you and telling you what kind of person he wants you. He wants you to be an honest person. He wants you to be a person who puts him first. He wants to be a person who, right, to think about all the fruits of godly wisdom, right? If you want to think about this, this is what God is, is taking us toward. Look back in chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. It's not filled with filth and dirt. Then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, and full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers. Right? So the wisdom of God is going to turn you toward one another with a desire to be considerate of the other person. Not to manipulate the other person so you can get what you want. Or just to be, you know, quiet long enough to let them get out what they want to say so you can ignore it and go what you want to say, right? You're going to be considerate to them and you want harmony. You want deep flourishing between you and that other person. You don't want to be in control. You want to be known and loved. There are a lot of people that think a relationship is about being in control. I like this relationship because I'm in control of it. That's not a relationship. That's a domination of another person. So the issue here is James is talking about is he gives more grace. God is there. He's willing to redirect our hearts and minds by his truth and guidance. Okay? Now what he, what he prescribes is something that's really difficult. Okay? He prescribes repentance, confession, and turning. Okay? I, I don't know about you, but in my own life, I've been amazed at how much energy I will put out to try to avoid confessing and owning sin. Man, will I put out a lot of energy. Right? I'll be like that watermelon seed, you know, on the picnic table. Every time God tries to press down, I just kind of, you know, out the side, and out the side. And then, you know, I give all the, the things. But God, you don't know what she did. God, if you had to live with these people, you would do the same thing. Now, I don't say that straight out, but that's what I'm thinking because it sounds really bad to say it, right? Oh, this is so hard. This is too hard for me to love them and forgive them. Are you kidding me? For me to care about them? God, we tried this so many times. I want to give up. I want to give up. I want to give up. I don't try anymore. I want to write them off. God, can I just be apathetic? Can I just be whatever? Can I do that? God said, no, no, no. No, that's not a wisdom from above. That's a wisdom from below. That's a wisdom from below. And so James says you need to, right, listen to these terms. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You must draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You must cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts. You, and I, this is a double-minded person. 
when I, I translate that for myself, I said, you halfway committed people. You must lament and mourn and weep. Let your gladness be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourself in the Lord's side and he will lift you up. You know, the, the, the sweetness of God is that he won't leave us in the places where we are. And he recognizes that when we make a God of ourselves, we're killing ourselves. And we're trying to organize people to do everything that we want them to do. We're, we're dysfunctional and broken. And we're not actually loving the people in our life. And God wants us to recognize that and turn from it. You know, and I, I wrote this to myself here is to draw near to God. And this, this is a long vein of scriptural wisdom that he's talking about here, right? To draw near to God is first to come to him. I don't know if you've ever found this about yourself. I, there's this difficulty at getting started in praying. You ever found that? Just a difficulty to open your mouth. And so I, I was driving here, I was driving here this, uh, this morning, and I was in the car, and I got this podcaster that I like, and so it, uh, I pu plugged it in, I wasn't even planning on listening to, but the way the car goes is it just starts it right up automatically, right? So it starts right up automatically, I'm about two minutes into the drive, and then seriously, I get this thing, Greg, turn that off, you need to talk to me more than you need to hear him. So I turned it off. But, but to do that, I had to talk out loud. So I'm driving down the road and I'm saying, God, you know, I'm sorry. I, I need to talk to you more than I need to hear him this morning before I walk out there this morning. And God, please, would you, would you be kind to me this morning? Thank you Lord, for your mercy. I just started praying through this morning. I started praying about the pride in my life, uh, about the things that happen. And it doesn't take long to figure it out. Uh, Rana, of course, would be a much better wife if she just did everything that I wanted her to do and actually anticipated my needs before I even told them to her, right? Uh, she should do that, and, and it'd be much better marriage if those kind of things happen. Now, I don't say that out loud, but that's how I often operate because she, when she doesn't do something that I thought she should have done, then I'll, I can be passive-aggressive, I can be irritated, right? I can withdraw from her and not give her what she wants, Right? I can say, okay, well, that's, uh, that put one in the bank there. Next time you ask me to do something, I don't think I'll do it. Right? Those are all the kind of things that are there in terms of pride. And here, the remedy for it is not to go figure out how to get my wife to do something. It's get on my knees and say, Lord, I am full of myself. I have set myself up as if I were you. I become a judge of my wife as if I'm the lawgiver. And uh, I have taken your place. God, forgive me. And this is fun. What this reminds us of, every act of pride is fundamentally an affront to God. That's why you go to him to confess it first. Whenever you elevate yourself and try to structure people in your life in ways that just please you and you're not concerned about them pleasing God but pleasing you, that's when you're trying to operate like God in your family or in your relationships. And so James says, you, you come with a broken, contrite heart. You own your sin and confess it. You name the evil you have done in elevating yourself over God and in abusing your brothers and sisters. Receive God's grace that leads you to nearness to God and confession and realignment of your heart. You know, I've said this to you before, and when you come together as a church, missiologists will tell us that about 80% of what we do as a church is kind of culturally determined, meaning there's no thus saith the Lord about uh, the vast majority of the things we do on a Sunday morning. It's just a matter of wisdom about how we operate. But those wisdom issues are what split churches, what sends people, you know, running around to different churches so that they can have more of their preferences fit. And that often become the grid that people use to evaluate a given church or a given group of people. How well do they fit my preferences? And we operate with pride and it causes us to be people who are divisive. So here's what, here's some biblical uh, words of wisdom. Malachi 3, 7 and 8. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? And in the context of Malachi they're, they're, they need to return because they've been robbing from God what they owe to him. 
So will a man rob God? Yet you rob me, but you ask, how do we rob you in tithes and offerings? You are under a, under a curse, the whole nation, because you are robbing me. Isaiah 1, 15 to 20. When you spread your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood and and wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Psalm 24, 4. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Psalm 119. Sounds a lot like James. Verse 113. I hate double-minded people, but I love the law. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Away from me, evildoers, that I may keep the commands of my God. Sustain me according to your promise, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. Uphold me, and I will be delivered. I will always have regard for your decrees. You reject all who stray from your decrees, for their deceitfulness is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your statutes. My flesh trembles in fear of you. I stand in awe of your laws. And then Jesus, Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, who repent and confess, for they shall be comforted. And then probably... One of the most famous ones from David's confession psalm in Psalm 51. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And this is James, right? You know your pride is at work when you're excusing your sin. You know it's at work when you're excusing your sin. When you're standing back from what God requires you to do. You're excusing your sin based on some external thing. And you're saying implicit to God that, God, you haven't given me the resources to do what you're asking me to do. It's too hard. And God said, no, no, I will give you everything. I love to provide you with all the resources you need to love your husband, to love your wife, to love your kids, to love that employer that doesn't deserve to be loved. To work is unto the Lord in an environment where people don't appreciate you. I've given you the resources. Come find life with me. Now, I'll just say a couple things here. The rest of the chapter is he's going to apply wisdom in two specific circumstances. About speaking, about other brothers and sisters. right? And this, this is for us, this is well worth, we may come back and talk about this at length at another time. Um, but there's so many ways that we can use our speech uh, to manipulate and gain control over other people. You can do it with your wife, with your husband, and your family, right? This is the kind of speech that he's talking about here where um, we can disable people for life. I deal with people all the time that have had somebody say to them something like, you can't do anything right. That's the kind of thing he has here. Or speech that attacks and evokes anger. You idiot. How could you be so stupid? Really? How could you miss that? Or expressions of contempt. Right? I've had students sit in my office and just look at Cedarville and see some of the hypocrites and the broken students and the broken faculty and people that are around and say something like this. And you call yourself a Christian? You're so full of it. Or speech that's uh, cynical, accusations. Yeah, I I bet that's what you want. I bet there hasn't been a wife or husband that hasn't said that in their head to their husband or wife. I hear what you're saying, but I don't believe you. Right, I bet that's what you want. Or 
this kind of polite insinuation, this is a little bit more of a, a more expert sort of cut that we give to people, right? It sure helps to know the right people, doesn't it? When we see somebody succeed. Right? Oh, it's good to have the right, it's all about contacts. Okay. Or, this is what we do often in the Christian world, we hear somebody say something or represent Christ, and we say, oh, not bad, not bad, but, you know, I have a few things I might recommend to help them improve it. And our pride is there. I am the standard. I am the one who knows how to do it right. And if they agree with me, then they're great. If they don't, then maybe, maybe they could do it a little bit better. And we don't, we don't see that. We do that to our kids. We do that to each other. And our words are attacking people. The way I t it says speak against, I just translated it to myself as to verbally attack one another. And so James says, if your pride is at work, your speech will be trying to elevate yourself. And then he gives one last example, is that it'll show up in your, I put it this way, your idolatrous dreaming, that you'll be making plans without consulting God about them, and you'll be unprepared, especially if God decides that your plans aren't going to happen. I don't know how many people, right, this is, this is right at the core of Jesus where the, the wealthy man in Luke 12 comes up and says, I've, I've got everything saved up for retirement. I'm really looking forward to a good retirement. And then Jesus steps in and says, well, today your soul's required of you. Right? And so the issue here is we come to this. I, wa I want to say to you, as a fellow arrogant person, as a fellow arrogant person, I want my way. I want my way. I want to be elevated. I want to bring ideas to my department and I want everybody to say, Greg, what a smart guy you are. I, I, want, I want to shape the things that I'm a part of. I want my wife, right, to listen to my ramblings about my sermons and say, Greg, that's the best thing ever. I, I want my wife right, to appreciate these kind of things. I want those things. I want to be elevated. I want people to say nice things about me. And I struggle with this as a, as a daily thing. My own insecurities are, are in the idea that, that you know, I, I'm insecure. I want people to make me feel better about myself. And then when people don't say the things that they should say about me, I, I, I'm justified in having a little, little self-pity party because I deserve better treatment than that. That is all about my pride. And in all of that, it's ugly to think about that as spiritual adultery. Is that we're ripping God from the heavens, we're elevating ourselves to the authority, and we're saying that the people in our lives exist to worship me. That's, that's an ugly thing. Right, as you think about it. And the other side of that is where we're turning to God we're getting resources from him and he's giving us more grace so that instead of being driven by selfish ambition, we're driven by loving people to Jesus as Jesus. That's what I want. That's what I want for my boys. That's what I want for my girls. That's what I want for my wife, for my husband, for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't want a congregation that's divided over things that don't matter. That's a huge mission, a great God to serve. And by God's grace, right, we want to follow him together. And so when we come to this issue, I'm going to ask uh, the, the team to come up and sing for us as we, as we conclude. I, I just really want to encourage you. This is a heart-searching type of message, right? And I, I, would, I would not I, I, I'd be pretty comfortable just in terms of the things I know. There probably isn't anyone in here who doesn't have a conflict with somebody. Maybe it's right in your home. Maybe it's in your extended family. I just really want to encourage you to go do some heart searching with regards to your attitudes and see whether or not you really want God's ends for that relationship or really you're fighting over being treated the way you think you deserve or whether you really are trying to get that person to a place where they really get God's goodness and grace. Because that's, that's a core struggle, right? And the evil one, we know, to resist him is to resist elevating myself, right, at the core. Will you sing for us, and we'll conclude.